welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I am with David and Tim. How are you guys doing today? Good brother. Thanks for having us on. Good. Thank you, Dennis. So today uh, I'd like to talk about return to duty and, uh, you know, some of the great work that you guys are doing uh, for our service members and uh, and uh, hopefully press uh, push the word out and uh, hopefully get you inundated with people to uh, help. So if, uh, you know, start off with you, Dave, would you please uh, do a quick introduction of yourself? Sure, definitely. Um, let's see, going back, I graduated from Citadel in 97. I actually started out as a police officer and deputy in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, obviously, after 9-11, um, instead of going back and doing the commission route, I ended up doing a combat medic back with, when it was 91, crossing over being 68 whiskeys and everything else. And shortly after, I went into, to selection and, you know, became an 18 Delta, been one since. Uh, 20th Special Forces Group now, uh, 3rd Battalion, 20th, uh, the newly formed Human Performance Wellness Unit. Uh, my role there uh, essentially is being able to help uh, kind of as a liaison with uh, other nonprofit entities that are out there and some private sector solutions, if you will, being able to help um, those within our unit as well as everyone else for that matter. So um, I have some other uh, time in the Foreign Service as well as some other remote medicine government jobs. Uh, but I transitioned over into the endoscopic spine world about six, seven years ago. Have a little bit of experience robotics, navigation, everything else, but it was the big catalyst for, you know, having my own spine injury in Afghanistan in 2010. Um, essentially, I didn't realize it was planting the seed that eventually when I'd find myself working as a clinical education manager, it would really open my eyes uh, to a lot of procedures that weren't being offered to our own um, service members, military athletes, if if you will. So nice, uh, Tim. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, so I uh, enlisted in the Marines right out of high school with a O three fifty one anti armor assault man. Um, at the end of my enlistment, I was hired by a fire department. I served eleven years, firefighter, paramedic. I was actually uh, actually an officer. I was a lieutenant. Um, line of duty injury had to retire um, from a uh, actual back injury. Um, retrained. Uh, went to school as a respiratory therapist, worked 10 years as a respiratory therapist uh, in hospitals in South Florida. Uh, about three years ago, I got into the device industry, and I spent the last two years working for the same company as David doing uh, endoscopic spine robotic navigation um, and the like. Nice. So what I really like to dig into is this uh, return to duty. So everybody loves an origin story. So David, uh, like, how did this thing get started? Uh, I guess kind of a little foreshadowing there. Um, didn't realize uh, when I I, um, I got my injury, I had a cervical spine issue, you know, had some lumbar spine issues, not kind of shocker to anybody from our career field. I don't think anyone really technically fully survives um, any length of time in our career field without having some form of it. Uh, in my case, basically mine was a multi-level uh, cervical spine issue. Um Still kept pop, you know, getting loaded up on tour at all to keep going out on mission until the end of the tour. And uh, sure enough, came back home, got the MRI, had uh, multiple, multiple level uh, herniations uh, that were causing my radiculopathy down my right arm. Felt like hot lava, if you will. And uh, so anyways, I went to Eisenhower Medical. I was in the queue, if you will, uh, to go ahead and get ready to get a, a multi-level fusion. And uh, essentially what happened was uh, here we are, you know, we kind of like to think of ourselves as even at best, hopefully a mediocre medic and understand a little bit about medicine. Um, but I realized I was flat footed uh, when it came to understanding my own spine care. Uh, it's not something that we really go, you know, deeply in depth, you know, at JSOM TC or any of our stuff for that matter, if it's not trauma. And so uh, I just happened to ask the battalion surgeon and our PA at the time, I said, hey, man, I said, uh, when I go get this fusion in 14 days, what's this going to do to my career? And I'm like, well, you know, technically you're not going to be able to have the same status with your halo and die physical. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's going to change things for you. And I kind of laughed and I said, well, now I know I'm not doing that. I said, I want to know what my action, my options are. And uh, at that time, between my care manager and different people like that were like, uh, well, nobody really ever asks. 
<laughs> nobody ever kind of quote unquote pushes back. And I was like, well, I understand you guys own me, own us. Uh, but in this case, I am asking, you know, because I'm doing some reading now and starting to become my own advocate. And so fast forward, I was able to thankfully um, avoid um, they were willing to allow me to see if a long term recovery, what would happen, what would go with it, because I was right on the cut between, you know, kind of forcing the hand. And I'm very grateful that I did. Um, it took a while, but basically things were able to start getting better and recover. Um, I still have some issues, if you will, that I work through. But what I didn't realize at the time was uh, it would be many years later um, before I'd actually find myself transitioning out into the private sector, spending more time with my family and everything else. But wanting to parlay my background and love of medicine and teaching and finding it in the ultra minimally invasive world of spine surgery as a clinical educator uh, for a German uh, endoscopic spine company. And as you know, Jared Shuey, you know, I recruited him over uh, from another fellow 18 Delta instructor there, Jason TC, is a reservist. And then he subsequently recruited Troy, who's a retired PJ, who's got cervical to sacrum, you know, spine issues. But what we started doing was we started looking around and going, man, we're seeing hundreds and, you know, by now thousands of these cases and going, why aren't these options really being offered, you know, to the military athlete, if you will. And before we knew it, we found ourselves basically having buddies of ours and me still through 20th group, you know, Jared, you know, as an IMA guy at the schoolhouse, having people hit us up and going, hey, man, I trust you guys, but I don't know who the hell to trust going to Google or some marketing or you know, no offense, but, you know, what's going to happen if I get sent through the military system? And so we started sending them the people that we we personally trusted, you know, that, you know, kind of like, you know, being back, you know, in the order merit list, you know, and doing, you know, peer vows, if you will. These were people that we saw being the gray men in the operating room, standing right there beside them doing the cases. We knew what kind of people they were, uh, you know, let alone what kind of surgeons they were, but we saw their outcomes and the amazing stuff that they were doing. And we're like, we didn't care what school they graduated from or anything else like that. We just knew they were getting the results. And so we started sending, you know, different, you know, folks from the the soft community there. And it literally started saving careers because we had guys that were in the pipeline to get fusions the same way I were, I, I was, um, that didn't, you know, upon second opinion, didn't really need them. Somebody was ready to pull that big, you know, you know, hardware lever on them was about to change their life, their career and everything. And we've saved several careers and we were doing that informally. And so uh, a lot of the audience, you know, may very well know uh, Joel Gupton, a very dear friend of ours. Um, uh, I'll try not to get emotional. I, I think about him every day. I have his picture up, actually a couple of pictures of him around our house. And uh, Tim and I, you know, know him. I served with with Jared for a long time. Tim and I worked with him at, uh, over at D-Day Response Group, actually helping to teach uh, some TCCC stuff, you know, on the civilian side. And Joel was right there in it. Uh, well, after Joel passed, um, it was a real big catalyst because we'd been, he it was included, he had been kicking around the idea with us about taking what we were doing informally and uh, finding a way to actually bring it to scale, how we would get organized and help more of our guys to save more careers, hopefully get them off some of the uh, maladaptive things that we'll do sometimes to deal with our pain, whether it's booze, prescription meds, or maybe even some other stuff. And uh, so anyways, um, several months after uh, Joel passed, uh, it was a catalyst. We're like, we got to stop procrastinating, man. We got to get after and do this. And none of us were comfortable. <laughs> Candidly, we suck at, you know, trying to run business and everything. We're good at being blue collar medics. Uh, but that's what started the journey. Uh, Tim joined on. I asked him. Kevin Rash, who was a chaplain uh, over in the rest of the PJ Wings there out of Patrick. Uh, Nate Alway, as you know, uh, Jared Shuey. Uh, Josh Albers, a bunch of 18 Deltas, and then a whole bunch of clinical researchers, MDs, and this powerhouse group of surgeons we've got that can't buy their way, they can't donate their way in. And uh, we started, you know, figuring it out, and we've been able to take care of a whole bunch of patients since then. Sounds outstanding, outstanding. So I guess when did you guys start really going to work other than like you're informally hooking guys up? Uh, when did return to duty start and when did this kind of pipeline that you've created start? Tim, Tim, when will we oh. officially say that we once we oh. flipped the switch, when was it? So uh, we started the organization in terms of incorporating it 
in February of 2022. We spent like a year trying to organize everything and raise funds. Anyone that would come to us, we were doing like still the informal referrals. Um, we kind of went with a soft law launch this year in uh, late February, early March, um, establishing and publishing our, our website and then reaching out to people within various commands. So I would say within the last three, uh, 10 weeks to 12 weeks. And since then, um, we've taken in 11 patients. Nice. And I'm nice. not counting the ones we did informally. There's probably another six or seven before yeah. we actually came up with our system that we have in place now. Right. And, I mean, that's Dennis, not bad for 18 months. Yeah, and I'll share part of the reason why we really didn't want to go on full blast, as you can imagine, is um, we just want to make sure we did it right. Like, mm -hmm. we've really focused on quality. Uh, for all the patients from the very outset. I mean, to be able to pick up the phone and text or call any of these given, you know, orthopedic or neuro, you know, surgeons, if you will, is is a real, it's an honor, you know, candidly. They're highly sought after and clawed at, you know, by, as you can imagine, a lot of different device companies and different things out there. And because we have a very unique, a very different relationship with them, very much built on respect and trust and everything else, we're, we honor their time. So, the big part is, is also we just wanted to make sure that, you know, for every person that we say we're going to help you, that we really are doing the best that we can with limited funding, you know, mostly self donations and everything else. We're working pro bono, a lot of the stuff, as you can imagine, like most organization, organizations do right now, we work our day jobs and then we hustle our butts off, probably working another easy 40 hours a week uh, across the team. And uh, but with that is that uh, I would say to your point, we went into that VIBP tour at Fort Bragg, taking a bunch of our surgeons and we walked out with a bunch of patients. And then we turned around and went to Soma and Samza and we walked out with more patients. Um, and with that, I'll touch on the fact that, you know, we recognize why we're we're wanting to, to do it quality. Um, what was really shocking to us and Ricky did so, you know, give him a shout out to him, uh, longtime SOAR medic over with 160th. Now, congratulations to him. He's getting ready to go to Rush uh, Medical School. Um, great representation. But he helped us, you know, there with the Brain and Spine Committee, getting all our surgeons that went in and presented. But one of the remarkable parts was the fact he told us, he's like, man, you know what's shocking? He goes, I did a keyword search of Soma and Samsa. Uh, and they all for spine, the word spine, he goes, the only entry that came back was return to duty. Mm -hmm. goes, That's pretty shocking. Yeah. And so with that, it's kind of one of those dynamics we look at and say, hey, you know, we realize there's a lot of patients out there. There's a lot of backlog. We want to help. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to compromise, um, you know, doing a good job at it. So we're proud of what we've got so far. But I think as we, you know, grow our resourcing and stuff like that, we're going to be able to help a lot more folks. Yeah, I hope so. So, you know, let's start talking about that. So, you know, if somebody listens to this podcast or they see, they learn about you somehow, how do they get in contact with you? What does the pipeline look like? What can they expect? Tim, you want to go ahead because you do sure. most of the intake and care coordination now. All right, so on our website, uh, www.returntoduty.us, there's a tab at the top that says get help. Click that. It's going to bring you to a fillable form. And it's nothing, uh, no PHI there, no um, medical information. It's just contact information. Uh, you fill out the form. You submit it to us. Um, from there, one, uh, someone that's a case manager like myself, um, I, I mean, I have a lot of hats that I wear, but um, I'm usually the first person to contact the person. I'll give them a call, just talk to them, you know, on very basic terms about what's going on. Um, if they're going to be a, a good candidate to work with us, Right now, we're focusing on uh, active uh, reserve and guard special operations personnel. Okay. So they would then, they, I get in touch with them, I give them a call. From there, we're going to send them um, a link that allows them to upload any images and any reports that they have. And then this is where you have the protected information. So that's secured. One of our partners, that's uh, a Dr. Messi Mala, he works out of a the DISC Institute in uh, California, and they're allowing us to use their um, their servers, their record keeping. So it's maintaining that compliance and uh, protecting people's information. Um, from there, um, we have a people that do the intake call. So they'll call them up and it's like you went to the telehealth visit to your doctor. But here we have a person that works specifically um, in neurosurgical doing that. 
right? So once we have a package put up, your information is anonymized. And then we have these round tables that we meet with um, usually about 12 or 13 neurosurgeons have been on the last two. Um, and then your information is presented to them. They come up with kind of they're passing it around the table with what everyone thinks is the best idea. Um, sometimes you get consensus. Sometimes you get a, a variety of opinions. We write that down. We offer that to the patient. If they want to go with a specific surgeon that specializes in, say, the procedure that they're recommended to, we can facilitate them being accepted as a patient within their practice. So right now, all the docs that we're working with um, accept TRICARE, right, so that this isn't out of pocket. What we have to do, is, this is where return to duty really has to do some behind the scene type stuff, is we're going to help you with your PCM, getting a referral to a civilian doctor, right? And hopefully uh, the care coalition is going to help you with any travel and lodging and temporary orders to go to that surgeon if you have to travel. Um, if you're located right now at, say, Fort Bragg, there really isn't um, a surgeon that's in our network that you can just drive over to in 30 minutes. The way the military addresses the shortage of qualified surgeons is they send you out to civilian docs in the community. And these relationships are based upon proximity to the base, not necessarily this surgeon's um, expertise in correcting uh, injuries on active type military personnel. So what we did is we kind of looked for docs that are doing this already with military people, um, with these minimally invasive motion preserve, preserving techniques, or we found docs that are heavily involved with professional athletes. So a number of our surgeons are NFL surgeons, Division I surgeons, uh, work for a uh, contracted surgeon that handles all the Red Bull athletes. So these types of uh, professional athlete, tactical athlete comparison, it, I think it's the closest you can get for um, a surgeon that has years of experience taking care of people that are going to, their goal is to go back out there and continue, right, continue doing their job and if that's not your your goal from coming to us, that you just want to, you know, be able to play with your kids and you're going to retire, that's fine too. But we, if your goal is we have people in their 20s and 30s that they're current currently want to go back to operating, you know, in soft. So yeah. we're trying to help them do that. Like myself personally, when I hurt my back, I had operation um, that ended my career as a firefighter. I mean, I could physically do the job, but it's like the stigma attached with a, a procedure. So mm -hmm. that they, they won't, they're like, oh, you're too much of a liability, so we have to retire you. Right. We're trying to keep let people stay in that want to stay and continue serving in the capacity. Tim makes a good point to. there. One of the big revelations that we've had through this, um, and I know Nate would share this story, but there's others out there. I'll just speak in general terms, is that, um, you know, candidly, we're here to work truly, you know, not to sound cheesy, but basically the whole by, with, and through. I mean, uh -huh. we know that it works. Um, we recognize who we are as an organization. Um, we're not trying to be everything to everyone. We're just, we know that we have a very unique skill set when it comes to helping folks and advocating and educating uh, for spine care. And we also have a very unique trusted network of surgeons that we go with. It doesn't mean that there are, aren't other great surgeons out there. We're not saying that at all because candidly, you know, in a calculated, you know, vetted fashion, I'm sure we will add more and we're doing that, but we're very methodical and intentional about how we do it because we recognize the same way, you know, being doc on the team, um, you know, once again, if you're like me and you're just a mediocre, you know, medic, you're still know the responsibility that you have. You're trying to do the best you can of being that bridge between your teammates and that next level of specialty care, of expertise, whatever it may be. And if they come to you, you don't want to violate that trust. You're doing the best mm -hmm. that you can to really honor that. And we're still the same guys, you know, you know, essentially just not getting paid fully in sunsets anymore, if you will. Right. Um, so the goal is, is to be able to essentially provide, um, as Tim said there, Surgeons that you go, I know that they have built their practice and their depth of expertise. The outcomes are there that they are dead focused on helping people get back 
and they understand the unique cohort, if you will, that we have. Dr. Messi Wallow did a phenomenal job, the presentation there at SAMHSA, um, showing artificial disc, um, things like na that nature with Red Bull athletes, uh, guys from the agency. He treats a lot of NSW, SF guys there at Newport Beach, California, where he's at. And so he could show some of these examples, some of these case studies, if you will. And one of the command surgeons, you know, stood up, asked a question to Dr. Messi Wallow there, was like, hey, man, he's like, you know, this is fantastic. You know, what kind of studies do you have on this? You know, how for this cohort, this very unique patient population that we have? Because it's interesting because we know there's certain governmental controls, if you will, just to even get in the military, yep. uh, let alone to stay within your uh, career field, depending upon what special, you know, physicals you have to do. And he said, well, you know, there's some out there, but they're kind of disjointed and, you know, having something where we kind of bring that all together. He goes, I do it for my patients because I'm considering whether they do a lot of vertical motion between volleyball, basketball, a lot of twisting, whatever it may be. He goes, and I'll even select the implants that I use solely a la carte for that particular patient because I know they're going to get back up and do what most normal human beings won't. They're going to expect a rebound. And so even my practice, he'll tell you, all these guys will tell you, they'll even use prehabilitative things because they're anticipating um, whether it's their ins and outs, different things they put them on, whatever it may be, that the moment they get done with the procedure, they're expected not to be lagging, sitting around on painkillers and everything else. But they also don't want in the premature to jump out there and re-injure themselves. It's a very fine balance. And we recognize Altruistically, we're doing this for our brothers and sisters because we know how we're wired. This is the life we've you know, put a lot into it. We want to stay in our career field or at least stay as much active as we can in retirement, you know, with your family. But we recognize, you know, the upside candidly, uh, if you have to appeal to, to that component for the government, is there's a return on investment. There is. There's a lot of money that's been spent in making operators, pilots and everything else like that under the sun. And if we can't get you to do it for the altruistic reasons, hopefully we'll get you to do it because we recognize you can keep somebody doing what they prefer and love to do longer. Um, and even if they have to retire, ideally, we can treat them better and do better, get it early so that you don't have to do more disruptive, very hardware based, you know, procedures as early, if not ever. Um, but one of the things we point out um, kind of where I was going with that is that a professional athlete even though entertainers, we appreciate them and everything else like that, those franchises have dumped a lot of money into them. And so when they get injured, they don't sit around for an MRI six months, 12 months, 18 months. Some places within the military institution will be happy enough just giving an x-ray and go, okay, that's good enough. Where what you really need is an MRI to see the soft tissue where there really is if you're crushing that nerve in there. And if conservative treatment won't work, then you, what you need to do is have early intervention to decompress that nerve. And I'm going to go ahead and break out the model here. Right. So basically what you would have, for example, if this little spine model here, let's just say that this little red dot that you hear, this little bulge essentially is a, a herniation uh, that you have in this case, what would be, if, if I can put it there, that would be red and it's compressing and pushing against that nerve. So the goal is, is that if you can't be able to, you know, get that to, you know, basically um, return on its own and it's just not going away, but it's causing issues with pain and maybe even some deficit, like we say foot drop, your foot's dragging because you can't, you know, it's not working the same way. Then the goal would be to get down there earlier while it's not just crushing itself, almost kind of like a tourniquet, but instead of on mm -hmm. a vessel, actually on a nerve structure. In the case of endoscopy, where we got our eyes open is basically you would come down essentially with this small little tube right here. You would target it with a needle just to get to your destination using fluoro, but then you would come down in and you would actually retract and protecting that nerve away so it's shielded. Then you would come in with a scope essentially like this. It's going to go down inside that tube and notice how it's got a little working channel right there. With that, you're going to go in and literally just sculpt away what you need, kind of like a fine sculptor, instead of ripping apart the muscle and the tissue and having a dry socket and everything else, you're going to go down there with this teeny tiny side of a number two pencil, and you're going to go and basically spare that tissue and a lot of different stuff like that. And you're going to target specifically that little piece of herniation that's crushing that nerve, causing that pain, and everything else that's going on dysfunction. And then you're going to go in and you're going to watch it with a little bit of lavage of irrigation flowing through there like you're scuba diving in a cave. And then you're just literally going to sculpt away 
the, the disc or the bone that's crushing that nerve. And you're going to watch the whole thing up on a monitor. And in there are many instances, a lot of our surgeons are doing this awake. So instead of being yeah. under general anesthesia and all those negative issues, you're literally getting feedback from the patient, like Dr. Gardaki at Vanderbilt as one that does it, Dr. Paul Hull up in Cape Cod, uh, Lynn McGrath, different folks are doing all these things. But the cool part is, is that the patient's literally going to get up and walk away versus having all that soft tissue damage and everything under the sun, maybe some infection, everything. And you don't have to have all the painkillers that you traditionally would use to do that. Now, granted, not every patient is going to get treated with that because in some instances they do need a fusion or, in this case, an artificial disc so that it keeps the motion. What we're just simply doing is we're helping the system be able to get a patient identified faster so they're just not sitting there not knowing that they need the MRI or that they need an earlier decompression or treatment because a lot of our service members right now are. There is a uniformity component by being able to do instead of just because you happen to be stationed here, this is the only options you're going to get. The cool thing is, is that with us, we're being able to help the, the military treatment system to be able to say, we look at this patient and now, depending on what they need, they're not just simply isolated to what's available locally. We can be able to give them the same quality of treatment access anywhere in the United States. The remarkable part about that is there's a lot of professional athletes that don't even have that access. Mm. All they get is simply whatever their you know physician has a local relationship with in the area. And they might be doing 1988, 1990 procedures. They just haven't moved on to doing these things because they have no incentive. So ultimately, that's the part where our value comes in. We're just simply advocating. We have the ability to serve still as that bridge between the patient and uh, these different options. Yeah. No, that sounds outstanding. Um, so I can imagine with, like you mentioned before, you know, professional athletes, professional organizations, they're not going to wait. Uh, they put too much time, they put too much money into this person. They want to figure out, do we need to cut sling load or can we rehabilitate this guy? So, um, you know, are, are you accepting people that are, you know, chronic, chronic patients, they have chronic back pain, or are you trying to focus more on the acute injury? Obviously, the acute injury, it's going to be easier to treat. You're probably going to have better outcomes. But are you taking patients who have more chronic pain? So, yes. So the majority of the patients we have now, they've been hurt for a while. Um, we've had a number of patients that have a time of injury of greater than a year ago. And the surgeon that we were able to facilitate a consult with was the first neurosurgeon or orthopedic spine surgeon they talked to. They've been handled conservatively by um, their PCM, which for the most part is going to be family practice type um, physician. Um, maybe their battalion surgeon is an emergency medicine type physician, but they, they really don't have the expertise with these, um, these spinal injuries. Right. So we're talking someone that gets hurt and they fracture a bunch of vertebrae, then that's different. That shows up on an x ray and they're going to be treated differently versus someone that has a soft tissue injury and they don't see anything. And it's not just like muscles and ligaments, it's the, the disc cause con considerable problem. And the time that the nerve is compressed um, is important too. So if we can get someone seen sooner, they'll have less deficit after it's corrected. If that makes sense. So say the NFL, they're going to have a neurosurgeon evaluate an injured player usually within 24 hours. All right. Um, a soft dude is going to spend probably a year before he gets seen by a surgeon. And the reason the NFL does that is because if they identify something that needs to be immediately corrected surgically, say that bulging disc is compressing the exiting transverse you know, nerve root, and if we leave, let it sit for three months by trying to just send them to PT and some NSAIDs, you're going to cause a permanent deficit. But if they can go in and decompress outpatient and the patient may be right back to playing in, in several weeks versus mm -hmm. you know, six months of downtime trying conservative measures. So that, that's what we want to be able to do to help people. These people with these longer term injuries, uh, we have patients in our pipeline now that they got hurt 10 years ago and they just weren't getting satisfactory answers from uh, the military physicians that would have everything from we're going to wait until you have um, atrophy of your lower extremity muscles before we treat you to we're going to spend another six months doing conservative treatment. And these patients that we're showing to our surgeons, these, these images and files, they're like, 
that this person needs surgery. You know, this is something we can fix. And we have patients too that I, I don't know how they're st continuing to do their job, right? They're, they could be, they're just, you guys, you just suck it up and you keep going on, right? So there's the point now that you, you want to be able to have a person that is the expert in your injury that says, yeah, it's fine to suck it up. Go get conservative treatment. You don't need surgery. None of our docs are going to cut someone just to cut someone, right? They don't, they don't need the billing that bad, right? They, but if you need surgery, they're, they're going to be straightforward and honest with you and tell you these are your options. Yeah. I'll tell you, it's even a funny one, Dennis, is that a lot of our surgeons, actually, if you want to talk about what was very eye-opening to us, going from our world, or we didn't have to worry about insurance, whether we were taking care of a friendly, local national, or even sometime the enemy. Um, it was an eye opener, candidly, to see that that's basically what drives a lot of is, you know, much of our audience probably knows first world medicine drives the care and uh, very hard to reconcile. So I think in yeah. one sense, that's a good thing that many of us, because we have been loan providers um, as well as, you know, members of teams providing, we feel responsibility. You know, when we were sitting there, even as a support role uh, in these cases and everything else like that. Um, but I think you see where I'm saying where I'm going with it as a big part is, is that a lot of the surgeons that we identified were people that were either making less money <laughs> because mm -hmm. of the procedures that they were doing. Um, but it was almost like kind of like an FBI profiler. You're looking at them going, well, yeah, I would want this guy because he literally just basically purposely did not do what the other surgeon was going to do, which was put in cages, screws, rods and everything else when they clearly did not need that. And that's not going to be a mystery that anybody that hears this podcast out there, that's a lot of that goes on. And we've actually part of the service that we do is simply trying to help advocate to make sure that our guys aren't needlessly going to those places like a lot of them have been recommended for that if nothing else we're at least having surgeons who have this in their tool bag if you will these different skill sets to at least a filter that they can look at the patient and go yeah you'd be a good candidate for this and the reason why because we're not going to burn up any needless real estate if we do this if down the road you need one of these more disruptive invasive aggressive procedures because that's absolutely what you have to have okay then we'll do it but we didn't jump to that. That wasn't the first lever that we pulled. And that's yeah. in and of itself. When I was standing at that fork in the road as a service member getting ready to, you know, go right in to get this procedure done and everything else like that, like many of our guys, having somebody who is one of your own literally standing right there at that proverbial fork in the road going, hey, man, I may not have all the answers, but I got a lot more than you probably do right now. And we're going to help you out. And you got a whole damn team of people that are, that are backing you on this. And that's peace of mind that candidly you can't get from Google. <laughs> you can't mm -hmm. get from a billboard, fancy marketing in the airport or driving down the road or even when you phone a friend. And I'm not going to mention any names so I don't get myself in trouble. But there are certain entities on the Web that you can type in and like, you know, think you're going to get a good uh, rating, if you will, on a physician. Uh, but Tim and I know some stories on some out there that have legal lawsuits, not lawsuits, but actually have court orders against them not to practice in certain states in the United States. Yeah. But if you went on to these certain rating sites, Angie's List, if you will, of type ones, and you looked them up, it'll say no malpractice, no this, no that, and everything else, like no issues, excellent scoring. But if you did a simple search on them, you would find the honorable judge so-and-so has said you can no longer practice in the state because you've been mm -hmm. running around from one practice to the other butchering people. And um, doesn't mean you catch them all, but the reason why we keep our group small and we're very calculated about it is because we're at least trying to do the best we can to have people who really are making a concerted effort to do the right thing by the patient. Nice, nice. You know, having that uh, selection process with, the, uh, with both surgeons and I'm sure, you know, your patients of some kind. So, um, you know, obviously we kind of went through, you know, if you're, uh, you're a sur um, soft, uh, soft medic or soft member, back pain, um, how to kind of get into the pipeline. What if I'm not that and I just fall in love with your story and want to help you? How do I do that? Say, when you go to our website, we have a link for donations. So we're a 501c3, so anything you donate is tax deductible. Um, right now, none of us that are, we're all volunteers. None of us um, get compensated in any manner. Uh, we're still probably about 30% of our total expenses this year is coming out of pocket. We've gotten donations, but it's not enough to fund what we're doing now. And certainly as we wish to expand and provide um, services to 
more people, um, we're going to need more operating funds. So um, through the website, uh, there's also a contact address if you want to, um, websites, credit card, uh, contact address. If you want to send a check, you can send a check. There's an address we have listed. Nice, nice. So um, is there anything that I missed, either David or Tim, uh, that you would like to just put out? Any shout outs you want to do? I would say the entire uh, return to duty uh, surgeon network that we have, um, their time is obviously very precious. Yeah. And they're usually compensated very, very well. Uh, they donate that time to us um, very objectively. Um, so every one of them uh, that we have, we are immensely grateful for um, the entire return of duty staff, if you will, that's doing this, as we say, pro bono. Um, we kind of laugh because you can tell that it's very much in our nature. All of us are 25 plus, 26 plus years of public service, either on the streets, you know, of, of you know, here our own country or abroad, um, that we're still doing this thing. Um, we're doing it for all the right reasons uh, because we look at the friends of ours that we've lost um, that had the different struggles and challenges with it. We know homes, uh, families, marriages, children, careers, teammates, mission readiness that are impacted by this thing. And, um, you know, it's for the very same reason all of us signed up to do what we were doing. We just recognize that at this place in our life, this is the mission that we undoubtedly know um, that is worthwhile. Um, it is our lane. Um, and we recognize it for every single person that hopefully we help with their quality of life, you know, that kind of medicine, um, that with the rest of the days that we have, you know, to carry the proverbial torch, uh, that it's worth it. And what we hope is that other folks will see the value and the benefit of what it is we do. There's, there's governmental organizations that get full-time budgeting uh, to do this, if you will. And here we're mm -hmm. doing it, you know, out of our own pockets and small donations and volunteering and everything else. Um, we would just be very grateful if folks would support us so that we can actually expand our capabilities to have full-time dedicated, uh, you know, assets. And we have software, all these different things we're doing because we actually want to do long-term studies, open-ended, not just to get a 5, 10K approval, but long and term ended studies to really help make meaningful impact left of the operating room and right of their operating room as well as in it. And um, so, so we would obviously be very uh, grateful for that support because we want this to be something that outlives us uh, to continue to keep being, as we joke and say, the SpaceX uh, solution or, or, or a partner like is to NASA. We're just basically trying to be that that role, if you will, in the spine world, helping uh, be for, force multiplier for military medicine. Nice. Uh, Tim, anything, yeah. any last comments? I do. I just, I kind of want to mention an interesting story too, that's related to this and shouting out to um, some of our docs. So um, down in Miami, we have a Dr. Michael Wang that's through the university of Miami and he's been treating um, people down there at Southcom. And it's just coincidental that his practice happens to be near where the command is. So that someone that's assigned down there and they have a neurosurgical issue, they can get referred to him. But if you were at stationed somewhere else and there may not be, you know, a great surgeon next to you, you're just going to whoever's out on the street that's got us placard up. And it might not be the person that I want operating on me or my family member or my brothers. So mm -hmm. it's we're trying to correct this kind of geographic inequality of medical care. Right. If you want to go to a top notch type teaching hospital, it's, it's probably going to be in a big city. But if you live in a rural area you're going to have, you know, whoever's around there for the most part. We're trying to make sure that all these service members within our population serve have access to the same top-notch level of surgeons that we have working with us. And they're really amazing. They all all the ones that traveled with us to Bragg presented, they all paid for their own airfare, their own meals. We didn't we don't have any money to give them. They came because they believe in our cause, right? All these discussions when we're having with about our patients that are these anonymized roundtable discussions, none of them, that's all volunteer for them, right? So they're doing this because they want to serve um, the people that serve us, if that, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. It sure does. They're doing it for the love, right? Yes. Cool. Well, thank you both very, very much. Yes, we definitely appreciate it. Uh, we'll hopefully look forward to the uh, next opportunity. We can give you some uh, some new updates. I sure do. Thank you. All right. Take care. Have a good one. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine.
This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Out. Boy is waiting there for you.